Chris, what are you doing? Making a sandwich. Did you sleep last night? What were you doing? Are you searching for the last story? Anything interesting? Yeah, there's this interview with the water where Sakaguchi talks about the development process. Those are people, right? Yeah. Can you believe they spent a year and a half in pre-alpha? They could if I knew what that meant. Just in this blank, blocky arena. Not even any character models. Just this red guy called Tofukun. Is that a block of tofu? Wearing a pair of opera glasses and holding a pimp cane? Yeah. Dear Masahiro Sakurai, I know you're really busy in Japan, and your back probably hurts from having to sit on mats instead of chairs at work, but I want to ask you something. Super Smash Bros. is one of my favorite games, and Tofu-kun is one of my favorite tofu-based characters, and it's also my birthday soon. Therefore, I would love it if for my birthday, you could please put Tofu-kun in Smash Bros. Okay, thanks. Love, Miles. Hey everybody and welcome to the second episode of Jack All About Gaming and the second part of our Rainfall Trilogy... Trilogy. The last story was made by Mistwalker, a studio founded by Hironobu Sakaguchi who created Final Fantasy and most of my wet dreams. Now, the last story is a large departure from the standard Final Fantasy formula because there's no S in the title and it got mixed reception upon release. I'm gonna find out why. So, let's learn Jack All About The Last Story. the calendar for April. I don't even know what the picture for like the months after that are. I got I get really lazy with these. Let's watch Jack all about gaming where some guy pretends to know about gaming. This show is too cheap for a real song. Jack all about gaming. Now, if you recall, in the first episode I said that Xenoblade was a game with a lot of heart and fantastic design, but there were some technical and graphical shortcomings. The last story, to me, is kind of the opposite. It had great presentation and a lot of fantastic concepts, but it was plagued with a lot of issues in the actual gameplay and uh, the content itself that really held it back and stopped it from being great. So this episode is going to be all about exploring what it was that stopped the last story from being great and making huge waves, and uh, what they could have done to fix it. If we're going to explore that, if we're going to analyze the last story and its successes and its failures, uh, we're going to have to start at the very beginning. What kind of game were they trying to make? Hironobu Sakaguchi, my hero. He's one of the most celebrated Japanese game developers out there, although he's faded into the background after leaving Square Enix over a decade ago. His specialty? RPGs! Final Fantasy, Lost Odyssey, Rocket Launchers, all RPGs? All very different. Each game, he tries to tell a different story, and the rest of the game just builds around it. The last story came after a rare break in Sakaguchi's formerly frequent release schedule. It was developed by Mistwalker, the studio that he formed after leaving Square, and it was the most involved he'd been in a game's production since Final Fantasy VII, and his first time as director since Final Fantasy V- <coughs> Too many Fs. Fittingly, the last story bears more resemblance to the Final Fantasy series than any of the other games Mistwalker's developed. I mean, come on, you gotta admit, they're practically anonymous. In an Iwata Asks interview, Sakaguchi says that the last story came along at a, at a point in his career where he felt like he was out of step with other game developers, and he wanted to rethink the way that he made games. Sakaguchi and his men set out to make a game that didn't feel like any game before, both in narrative and in gameplay. And this is where I couldn't think of anything more to write in the introduction. The last story is an action RPG, and while it may seem like that would make it similar to Xenoblade, the comparisons are actually few and far between. Although Xenoblade and several other RPGs let you actively move around during battle, the focus is still more centered on RPG elements like stat buffing and status effects than, you know, action. This significantly contrasts with the last story, which places much more focus on your actual movements and actions. Blocking, taking cover, firing your crossbow at destructible objects, jiggle physics, the list goes on! 
Sakaguchi says that the battle system was designed around the idea of order and chaos. Whichever team managed to establish order on the battlefield was at a significant advantage. On the other hand, throwing the enemy into chaos is your best shot at dismantling them quickly, and you have several ways to accomplish this. You can either take out their leader first to significantly weaken the forces, throw hot coals or drop stalactites on mobs to deal massive damage and put them on the defensive, or just give your party specific commands in an effort to use their magic strategically. The biggest tool you're given to control the flow of battle is Gathering, the signature ability of the main character, Zael. After you gain it near the beginning of the game, you now have the ability to make all enemies leave your allies alone to focus on you. Though that may seem risky, there are numerous advantages as well. Casting magic in the game runs on a timer, and your allies will cast twice as fast while Gathering is active. Now, your allies can be knocked out five times before they're down for good, and each time their HP is depleted, they'll revive after a certain amount of time. However, if you run over their unconscious body while gathering, you'll instantly revive them at full health with an attack boost. Since you'll be taking a lot of hits while gathering, one strategy is to simply defend and let them attack you. Each time you're hit, you store a little energy. Then, once you stop gathering, you'll send out a burst attack that damages all the enemies on the field. So gathering, it's, it's uh... It's got a lot of upsides. Along with gathering, Zael is also equipped with a sword and a crossbow. Although there's an option to attack manually, the default sets your sword to automatically attack when you push the control stick towards an enemy. The sword strikes themselves are very flashy, and critical hits get a special animation that's incredibly satisfying. Switching to the crossbow is a simple button press, and aiming is very smooth. Honestly, if I had to sum up the entire battle system or a baby's ass in one word, smooth is a very apt choice. Zael vaults over his allies in cover, kicks over hot coals, and runs up walls in an incredibly fluid fashion that just feels nice. If you need something to contrast it with, let's just say that he feels nothing like the clunky, jerky Sora from the First Kingdom Hearts. The rest of your allies are just as fluid, and the AI is pretty intelligent when it comes to how they utilize their magic. Without spoiling much, let's just say there's a point in the game where you get to play as each party member in turn, and each one of them has their own unique feel that works quite well. I think my favorite part of the battle system, however, is the strategy segment that appears at the beginning of several battles. The action pauses and you get a bird's eye view of the arena and your allies kinda chip in on strategy as you look at what enemy units and environmental weapons are on the field. It helps each battle feel like its own challenge, with its own specific method for safely routing your enemy. I'd say that it truly feels like you have agency in the battle. While in Xenoblade, you often find yourself standing there as you wait for auto attacks to whittle down larger enemies, The Last Story's battle system actively engages you all the way through, and it feels like you yourself are struggling to establish order on the battlefield. Outside of combat, The Last Story puts its own spin on many RPG staples. The arena Mistwalker puts in place is one of my favorite arena systems in gaming. Instead of just a gauntlet you slowly whittle your way through like in Paper Mario or Star Ocean till the end of time, the arena throws you into a labyrinth of cells that each contain their own challenge with vastly different groups of enemies and environmental weapons. But the cherry on top definitely has to be the arena's color commentary announcers who are giving you the John Madden treatment the whole time. BOOM! Tough act and connected! The last story also has a weapon and armor upgrade system in place. Using resources that are dropped by enemies and found in chests, you can slowly build up various swords and armor pieces little by little, with some of the later transformations giving you some incredibly badass weapons in exchange for some incredibly badass resources. Although the armor's stats aren't nearly as varied and customizable as the weapons, it does lead into the last gameplay feature in the last story, character customization. Although the names and voices are locked in for each playable character, their clothing changes drastically based on the armor pieces that they have equipped. On top of that, you can color their clothing and armor with whatever dyes you want, especially as you collect materials to make more dye. As the armor levels up, the outfit gains more pieces. The nifty part of the whole deal is that you can pick and choose which pieces of the armor actually show up. Customizing the outfits yourself is a seemingly small step that goes a long way towards making it feel like your story. Hell, you can just have everybody fight in the nude if that's what you're into. <laughs> you know. You're weird. You guys are weird. As far as plot goes, the last story is actually pretty standard. It's a fantasy love story between the mercenary Zale and the princess Callista. And of course, in standard JRPG fare, things escalate until the world's at stake. There are several plot twists and hijackings by a higher power, and while it doesn't reach the heights of storytelling that made certain JRPGs instant classics, it's far above the worst we've seen. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the actual details of the story, because to me, the plot had very little to do with the actual success or failure of the last story. Uh, what I am going to talk about is how they tried to fuse the story and the gameplay together. That is interesting, and to me, a pretty huge success. This is something that Sakaguchi talked to Iwata about at some length. How do you make the player feel the story events even more powerfully? 
Well, Mistwalker planned to achieve this by enforcing the reality of the situation into the battles. For example, at one point of the game, the group is split. You fight as each party member in turn as they face overwhelming odds, and you realize just how much harder the fights are when there's not a whole squad to back you up. There's another point in the story where Zale is trying to prove himself to one of the army's top men. You then have to run a several story gauntlet by yourself, facing different challenges that require you to fill different combat roles. Finally, it culminates in a one-on-one -on -one sword fight against one of the game's toughest bosses. This is one of the few times where an RPG praises the player character where I actually felt like I earned it. This ain't all Pokemon Y. Oh, you beat my level 3 Pidgey on the first route with level 5 Fennekin. All hail my Pokefuhrer. Bull snakes. You yourself actually showed a proficiency in the battle system beyond just button mashing tackle. Honestly, the more I think about it, there are a load of memorable battles in the last story. West Side Story boss, spooky ghost boss, hentai boss. And that's because the fights are tied so well into the story itself. It rarely feels like you're arbitrarily stomping out poo snakes, because the reality of the situation is brought into each conflict. Is it perfect? Nah. But it's one of the highlights of the game, and frankly, a lot of RPGs could learn from it. Of course, all of the effort put into the gameplay and writing means nothing if the developer's intentions and themes don't get across to the player. Sakaguchi spent quite a bit of time with the character designer, Kimihiko Fujisaka, creating the aesthetics of his world. They wanted to, first off, create a female lead who you could really fall for. And the interview just got... got really creepy from there on out. Mm. I've got to say, the character models in the last story are the best looking out of any game on the Wii. Out of the ones that go for some kind of realism, anyway. Comparing it to the models of super stylized games like Galaxy isn't really fair. The characters are all distinct, and the environments have a polish to them that makes the game very easy on the eyes. Nothing I'd want to bone, though. You know what Mom said about sticking your dick in the scenery? Don't, don't do it. That's what she said. She said don't. The soundtrack isn't lacking any of that polish either. Each piece is beautifully orchestrated and sounds full. There's no irritating loops or oddly scored scenes to be found. From a technical standpoint, it's a very tight ship, and it makes a lot of sense when you see how much stress Sakaguchi put on building the aesthetics. Okay, so clearly, the Mistwalker team had a strong vision. They could do great work, which we saw through some of the presentation, through uh, the graphical polish, through some of the elements even. Uh, so, why did the last story, a game whose brethren made waves in the RPG world, make only the tiniest of ripples? They didn't finish it. It wasn't finished. They, just, they gave us like half a game, basically. The combat system was so smooth! It was fresh, responsive, and most of all, functional. However, no matter how great the foundation of a building is, it's not all that impressive if the only thing you build on it is a one-story stick house with no bathroom. When I first got into the game, I was stoked. The building blocks that you're taught in the tutorial set you up for a great experience, and honestly, the fights don't really stop being exciting all the way through the game. All of the disappointment came from a lack of things to do with the great core system. I talked before about how great the arena system is, and it is, don't get me wrong, but what sucks is the amount of replay value the arena actually has. Remember way back in the early 2000s, when Kingdom Hearts just came out, and you weren't alive yet? The Colosseum had so many different tournaments to do. So did its sequel in pretty much every arena in RPGs, because that's what makes them, you know, FUN! The last story has two different runs in the Colosseum. Two! It was such a great idea. Hell, I, I would buy a game of just that if it had online multiplayer. And by the way, we're not going to talk about the last story's multiplayer on this video, because it's a little bit dead. Also, when it was alive, it wasn't really very alive anyways. Somehow, Mist Walker pulled the side quest equivalent of holding up a bag full of his dog's favorite milk bones, giving it one, and throwing the rest into the fireplace. That is not how you take care of a dog, Mist Walker. Trust me, I've been down that road. The weapon and armor system also might as well just not be there. There are very few actual options. You know, the armor system's even worse. Y you just upgrade the equipment they already have. There's nothing really special to get from any of it, it it's just a little stat boost. Now, this wouldn't really be a big deal to me if there weren't already several interesting and effective upgrade systems in games like Monster Hunter and, and the forging in Fire Emblem. With the way that enemy drops work, there was so much potential to have an expansive upgrade system with branching paths. The side quests are odd as well. They definitely exist, but the game places such little emphasis on them that they might as well just not be there. I mean, they're so easy to miss that they just kind of feel like a half-hearted attempt to meet an RPG standard. While the city contains a good handful of different side quests at any given time, there's no way to track them. No option in the menu, no real notifications, no nothing. Actually, a lot of nothing. There's one entire feature of the game that just makes me scratch my head, and that's, uh, 
pumpkin growing. You, you grow pumpkins. You just have the ability to grow pumpkins for profit. That's it. Now, not all of the side missions are pointless. There's actually a number of useful ones, but there's no way of tracking them. It honestly feels like they didn't finish implementing the side quests into the game. I have one other huge piece of evidence that the game was rushed out before it was ready. The final level. Now, this is actually pretty infamous among people who have played the game. There's a really severe difficulty curve right at the end, and because of the way experience scales, the only way you can reach a high enough level is to grind against the powerful enemies in a single hallway. For ages. I feel like I missed an entire presidential term just getting ready for the final boss. And this huge level jump leads me to believe that Mistwalker had to cut a lot of the game they wanted to make just to get it out on time. When you add in the fact that there's a severe shortage of abilities for your characters to learn, they get like three in like 80 levels. It's hard not to assume that Sakaguchi had originally expected there to be much more content. Cause you know, most of his games have a lot of content. So where did all that content go? Well, I think the causes are twofold. The first cause was the limited power of the Wii, and the second was the amount of time spent developing the combat system. First, the Wii. It's no secret that it was the least powerful system of its generation, and getting it to turn out cutting-edge graphics along with dynamic gameplay was a real challenge. Now, I said earlier that the last story was among the best-looking games on the Wii, and that came at a price. The more complicated the particle and lighting effects got, the less processing power there was to devote to running the AI and, you know, everything else. This is where the combat system comes in. Sakaguchi shed a little bit of light on the development process in his Awada Asks piece, and it turns out they spent a year and a half simply working the combat system with some basic prototype models. They were creating an entirely new and unique combat system, and they wanted it to be as dynamic as possible. On the Wii's hardware, that was no mean feat. Alright, just think about it this way. When Naughty Dog set out to make The Last of Us on the most powerful console of the generation, they still couldn't accomplish what they wanted to with the AI. The last story was trying to do something fairly similar with their own combat system, taking a stab at having both sides respond intelligently and dynamically. The challenge of turning enemies from dumb cannon fodder into legitimately threatening, intelligent beings has taunted game designers for years, and maybe the Wii wasn't the best platform to experiment on. With all the time spent getting the combat to work, that meant less time spent in other areas, and I think side content was in that group. To the team's credit, they got the basic pieces working quite well. Even though the arena is lacking in content, it's still fun and a great way to do arena-style combat. However, that just made it all the more heartbreaking when I checked in constantly looking for new seasons and was turned down time and time again! It's PROM ALL OVER AGAIN! And now for the big one. Gathering. Along with being the combat system's main feature, Gathering is also the reason that Sakaguchi claims the combat system spent so long in development. They struggled to find a balance and the best way to integrate Gathering into the game. For them, it was a literal representation of trying to establish order over the battlefield. However, in many reviews, Gathering is called broken. And I have a hard time disagreeing. In virtually every combat scenario, there's no reason not to be Gathering the entire time. With the buffs it provides your party while also preventing any of them from being attacked, it's so easy to just gather and defend while they pick everyone off. It essentially gives you full control over an aggro system, a common device in action RPGs and MMOs which is usually more foe than friend. It also creates an environment where not maintaining your HP is somewhat rewarded. I'm not going to pretend to have an intimate knowledge of the programming process, but I bet this isn't the final product Mistwalker was hoping for when they started gathering. Now this sums up, in my mind, the main failures of the last story. Uh, a lack of content, a strange disconnection between a lot of the content that's actually there, and some elements, like Gathering, that really could've used more work. Now, with how polished the graphics, sound, and basic elements are, it's very likely that Mistwalker would've made all of this stuff great if they'd had more time. However, with how long it took them to get just the combat system working, I mean, this game was in development for, for years, for a very long time, uh, they probably couldn't afford to push back release anymore. At some point, you gotta start making money and stop spending it. This is why, in my opinion, The Last Story is a game that could really use a sequel, spiritual or otherwise. With all the basics now established, development time could instead be used fleshing out the world and fixing those mechanics that weren't balanced or even finished. In all honesty, it would only take a couple tweaks to elevate The Last Story to great status if it built off its predecessor. Most obviously, the amount of content. And I don't just mean adding more arena seasons, although a full tournament mode would be pretty incredible. I mean adding content to the main chapters themselves. See, the last story had a small handful of chapters that were actually completely optional. 
They weren't side quests, really, as they had the length and difficulty of other main story chapters, complete with their own interesting boss fights. I wouldn't be surprised if there were more initially planned, but it had to be cut because they didn't have time to finish making them. The members of your party were all interesting, but most were very lightly touched on. The optional chapter that dealt with Yurik, however, was one of the high points of the game from both a gameplay and a story standpoint. If each character had their own series of optional chapters, it would be a great way to help players level before the endgame, and add length to the story without it feeling like filler content. How cool would it be to explore each of the characters that way? I know this might seem like an odd suggestion, but players should have the option to play as somebody other than the main character. I wouldn't have even thought of this if it wasn't for that section of the game where you get to control each character for a few minutes. It's honestly impressive how well done each of the different fighters were, and it's heartbreaking that those few fleeting moments are all we get. Again, something I think Mistwalker intended to include more of. It helps keep the game much fresher if you're able to switch up the character you play as every now and then, and it opens the door for co-op play. Of course, the chief reason you play as Zale for a majority of the game is because of Gathering. And honestly, Gathering is potentially the biggest issue to fix. I'm tempted to say that Mistwalker should have just thrown it out the window, that their devotion to including Gathering ultimately held the game back. But the truth is, Gathering is interesting. And it does bring a new layer to the combat, it just wasn't perfected. My first thought is to give it more downsides. Maybe make it so that your guard is easily broken when you gather, which would eliminate the turtle strategy entirely and make the game much more challenging. Of course, checks and balances go two ways, and another option is to focus on creating other powers instead. Equip the rest of the party with unique powers that make them just as tantalizing to the player as Zale. I mean, heck, while we're at it, let there be enemies with abilities that can directly combat gathering, or, I mean, just let them gather themselves. How terrifying would it be to suddenly have control over your movements and attacks arrested from you due to an enemy's skill? Pretty darn terrifying if they found a good way to do it. For all of the faults that the last story has, almost all of them feel like elements that just need to be expanded. Not terrible ideas that shouldn't be revisited. Just like Final Fantasy, it could take a few entries in the series to really maximize its potential. And I genuinely hope that's what Mistwalker has going on. They haven't announced anything since the last story was released, but they have teased a sequel every now and then. If they end up announcing one, I'll be immensely interested. With everything they learned from the last story's experiments, and with the much more powerful Wii U on the market, another story has the potential to take the RPG world by storm. If you're an RPG fan, I would check out the last story, if only because of how interesting some of the ideas it presents are, and how well done some of the pieces are. The graphics and music are great, and the story, for only being about 20 hours long, is still actually really good. However, if you can't find it, you can't afford it, or you just don't care, that's fine. This isn't a big deal if you miss it. The bits of brilliant design are really weighed down by the general unfinished feel, and that's really what stopped the last story from uh, becoming the great game it could have been. And that sucks. Let's just hope that the reason that Mistwalker has been quiet the last couple years is because they're working on a sequel that fixes all these issues, and that Sakaguchi will burst back onto the RPG scene. Alright guys, thanks for watching, and thanks for bearing with me as I try to figure out exactly how I want this show to work. This was a pretty big departure from the way that Xenoblade worked, and uh, let me know if you think this works better, worse, if there are any other changes that might make this a smoother show. Uh, the next game is going to be Pandora's Tower. We will be finishing up the Rainfall Trilogy, and from there on, I will be moving away from Wii games for a good long time. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and keep jacking it! Still trying to work on a catchphrase. I don't think that, I don't think that one works, though. It sounds too much like masturbation. Don't masturbate, kids. I mean, unless you really want to. I'm not your dad. Dear Miles, I have received a request, and after much consideration, you ought to be castrated and removed from the gene pool! I am fed up with you prepubescent sack clickers and all your bullshit character requests! You guys think your suggestions are so important, but every time I want to suggest something for your successful franchises, oh wait, you don't have it. I any. thought about putting in King Kang rule, but then I realized you don't give me your money anyway. You want Goku so bad, then why don't you go play a Shonen Jump game, you f***ing idiot! Go. Mewtwo might seem popular, but he actually is kind of testing poorly outside the autistic demographic. Ridley isn't too big. I just hate you. Tofu-kun, why don't you eat some meat? Something that doesn't require eight pounds of soy sauce before it tastes like anything. You know why I look younger than I did in 1985? Because I spend every day bathing in the tears of virgins like you. In conclusion, 
Cry more. Love, Masahiro Sakurai, dictated but not read.